Good night and welcome to the Galen Hour. Um, this season we're focusing on Belize's medium-term development strategy and tonight in particular we're focusing on the state of poverty in the nation. So welcome, thank you for joining us. We have in studio with us tonight our co-host Miss Gabrielle Hulse. Gabrielle, welcome. Good night. Thank you so much. I'm really happy to be in studio this time. It's We're different behind the desk. <laughs> absolutely is. We're pleased to have you with us in studio. Um, so Gabrielle is our co-host for the season. I am your host, Diana Gomez Perifit. Um, the Galen Hour airs every Wednesday night, um, same time, 8 o'clock to 9 o'clock. And it is a production of Galen University. Um, we are focusing tonight, like I said, on poverty in the nation and the state of poverty. And we have in studio with us the representative from the Ministry of Human Development, Families and Indigenous Peoples Affairs, Mr. Dylan Williams, who is the director of the Planning and Policy Unit for that ministry. Welcome, Dylan. Hi, thanks so much for having us. Um, definitely appreciate having the Ministry of Human Development, Families and Indigenous Peoples Affairs uh, part of this um, show and of course um, sharing as much as we can uh, tonight with you. An absolutely important ministry in Most development definitely. of our people. Um, welcome again. We also have joining us tonight Mrs. Diana Castillo Trejo. She's the Director General of the Statistical Institute of Belize. Um, Ms. Trejo is joining us remotely um, via Zoom. Welcome, um, Ms. Diana. Hi, good night. Very happy to be here. It's a, it's a pleasure to have you with us tonight. Yeah, so tonight we'll be talking about poverty in the nation. We'll be hearing all the projects that are taking place, Gabriel, and the statistics that are used to to determine how we stand and how we are as a nation. So we'll come right back after a quick break and talk about the beef of the matter and where we stand as a nation. Stay tuned. <laughs> is on fire. These guys have some top speed of over 29 miles an hour. They blaze. Oscar, Oscar Kuros have attacked. Oscar, look for one more home. Oscar Kuros, the 2023 cross country champion. Look at the feel of the... Hi everyone, my name is Oscar Kuros. I graduate of Gillen University with a bachelor's degree in environmental science. I'm currently pursuing my professional career in cycling with the Miami Blazers. I can safely say that the critical skills as well as the time management skills that I've obtained from Yellen University has helped me in many ways that I could have imagined. And I can honestly say that I've applied these skills to both my cycling career and my everyday life as a professional. I want to serve as a great influence to the youths of today as to why an important an education is important. Let's get back into the classroom. Let's prove them wrong. Opportunities are limitless. member of the Gillen Eagle Alumni Association. Reconnect with your fellow classmates, rediscover the Gillen Eagle spirit, and reawaken your inner eagle. Come home, come celebrate. 20 years of excellence with Gillen University. For more information, contact 636-8881. Tune in to a brand new episode every Wednesday at 8 p.m. live on Love TV, Love's Facebook page, Galen University's Facebook page, and the Ministry of Economic Development's Facebook page. This season is in collaboration with the Ministry of Economic Development. Don't miss out on informative conversations centered around the medium-term development strategy.
With our unique student-focused services, Gillen University prides itself in doing everything possible to facilitate the success of Gillen Eagles. The flexible payment plans, student loan options, and Eagle scholarships make Gillen affordable, accessible, and attractive. Treat yourself to the gift of a Gillen education. Apply today and secure your spot. Come soar with the Gillen Eagles. Visit our website at www.gillen.edu.bz or give us a call at 615-3129 or 614-6415. Welcome back to the Galen Hour. Tonight we're talking about the state of poverty in our nation and I'd like to start the conversation by asking Ms. Trejo, who we have coming in by Zoom, to tell us a little bit about the role that SIB plays in the medium-term development goals and its achievement. Um, is Diana, you, yeah, there we go. Sure. Um, well, the SIB is the National Statistical Office for the country of Belize. Um, and because of that, we have a very specific mandate that is to collect, compile, analyze, and publish statistics on the country of Belize and our population and how they live. Now, how that supports the medium-term development strategy is in two ways. Um, one, we ensure that we provide data um, to inform decision-making and planning for the medium-term development strategy. So as policies and programs to implement the strategy are being developed, we are to ensure that data is there to guide that planning and those decisions that are made. And second, we also provide data on an ongoing basis to monitor our progress in achieving the goals under the MTDS. Um, so, you know, we will want to know as we're going along, are the, the programs and projects that are being implemented having the impact that we want to have? Are they indeed making the lives of our population better? Um, and you, you only know that by having information to measure our progress. Um, we also, I mean, we can't produce all the information ourselves, um, so we work along with other agencies to ensure that whatever information is needed to track our progress towards our goals, um, to, to inform decisions about whether, you know, changes need to be made for programs and, and interventions if they're not being as effective as we want them to be. Um, our, our role is to ensure and to partner with other agencies who also produce data um, to see that there is that information there available in a timely manner. Uh, in addition to that, we partner or we are partnering with the Ministry of Economic Development and the Sustainable Development Unit to lead in the monitoring and evaluation of the MTDS. So, you know, we will have a set of performance indicators that we will be monitoring. Um, and this is something that we are developing and will be working on throughout the life of the MTDS with these two partner agencies. Mm. Thank you, um, Diana. So very, a very critical role. We cannot really move forward if we're not able to know what it is we want to achieve, where we stand, and certainly um, if we're not able to monitor the progress of our um, projects. So um, very important um, mm. unit of for our country. Mm -hmm. And I think speaking from the Ministry of Economic Development, I think we all know, or even speaking from the government, I think we all know the role that SIB plays. SIB is a big part of informing our policies and informing the ev evidence-based policies that we want to create. Um, and like Ms. Anna rightly mentioned, they do serve a role in the M&E function of the MTS. Mm -hmm. But they also inform a lot of what we're talking about today, which is strategic objective number one, poverty reduction. Mm -hmm. And so I just want to ask Ms. Anna if she can give us a little bit of the insight from the latest poverty study um, done by SIB. What kind of insights, you know, did we see from that? And what can you tell the audience about what that says about, even if it's disaggregated by the data, what can we, what can we see about that? And maybe how can that inform the policies that we want to create to work Towards poverty reduction. Sure. Um, so the latest poverty statistics that we have produced, um, we actually introduced a new measure of poverty, which is the multidimensional poverty index. We launched that earlier this year, um, and our first set of data was for September of 2021. This is going to be an annual production, so now we are going to be able to monitor poverty annually. 
And what the MPI is, it's a non-monetary way of measuring poverty. We are used to measuring poverty in terms of a dollar value, a poverty line. This is a non-monetary way of measuring poverty that directly assesses whether or not households are able to meet certain basic needs or access certain basic services. You know, these basic needs um, are what we would consider essential to having a, a minimally acceptable quality of life or a minimal level of well-being. And so the multidimensional poverty index or the MPI assesses whether households are able to meet that minimum threshold. Um, how that is measured is by looking at um, a set of, well, essentially there are a set of these basic needs, we call them indicators, but they amount to just some of these basic needs, um, and these cover four dimensions of well-being, health, education, employment, and living standards. Um, and we look at things such as households' ability to access health services if someone in a household falls ill, mm -hmm. um, food insecurity, school attendance, if there are children in the household, employment, um, whether there's overcrowding in the house. And so we look at all of these different um, basic measures of well-being. And for every one of those measures, there's a cutoff, a criteria, where we would say, if the household doesn't meet this basic criteria, in this particular item, we will consider them deprived. A household that has enough of these deprivations accumulated one on top of the other, then is considered multidimensionally poor. So that's just to, to understand what exactly the MPI is measuring and, and what exactly it says. Um, so the results of the first MPI study that we launched this year indicated that just over 35% of all persons in Belize were multidimensionally poor. Um, and that is overall for the country. But when we look at the segregations, for example, by urban and rural households, persons living in rural areas were far more likely to be multidimensionally poor than those living in urban areas. Um, the households that were larger and households that had children were also more likely to be multidimensionally poor. Um, uh, households with elderly people, um, households where, you know, obviously where the head of the household is either not working or they have a job but they're underemployed, meaning they're not working full-time hours, um, those households are the ones that are more likely to be poor. And when we look across geographic areas, um, what we find is what we have been seeing in previous poverty studies um, for the past few years that there is a lot of poverty, multidimensional poverty, at least by the way this is measured, concentrated in the Toledo district. There is also um, an, uh, a high level of, or a relatively high level of multidimensional poverty in the Corozal district. And this is consistent with what we saw in the 2009 poverty study, the, the last country poverty assessment. Um, so, you know, um, you know, even even looking at it by ethnic groups, you know, same as we have seen previously, um, persons within our our Maya population are far more likely to be multidimensionally poor um, than persons within the general population. So, what we have seen with this is it gives us a clear picture of um, who and where poverty is concentrated. Um, it is very consistent with monetary poverty measures, meaning that we are seeing the same subsets of the population are being more likely to be poor. Um, but the added benefit of the MPI is that it also tells us how persons are experiencing poverty. Um, in urban areas, for example, you might have a much higher incidence of households that suffer from overcrowding. Whereas in rural areas, it might be a higher incidence of not having access to health facilities. Um, having this, this breakdown of not just who, but how poverty is experienced then um, serves for policymakers to be able to directly target their interventions on their programs um, to the places and the persons that are most in need and to target them in such a way as to address what their needs are within their different subgroups and areas.
Thank you. Quite a bit of valuable information. And we can see from so what you um, shared that it is absolutely important to guiding the minist all the ministries, but particularly the ministry that you're representing tonight, Dylan. Um, would you want to chime in here in terms of, we've talked about um, the 35% of our population falling within this um, category of multidimensionally poor. We've talked about Toledo and Corozal being two of the key districts um, ranking high up in terms of that particular um, indicator as well. Um, would you like to? Definitely. Um, so, so thanks so much, um, Ms. Um, Castillo Trejo, definitely for, for being able to, to shed, a, shed a lot of light in terms of what's the reality of the situation. As, as she mentioned, specific to the ministry, uh, when we looked at responding to poverty, First of all, we have to understand what it is. Mm -hmm. You know, what's the situation? What's the extent? And so understanding that first, when we really only focused on measuring poverty from the income standpoint, of course, there's a lot of things that we also exclude. Mm -hmm. um, and so when we start, and of course, globally, as there has been a shift in terms of understanding that poverty is more than just the income element, it's multidimensional. And so as you, as you see also, the shift from the, um, the Millennium Development Goals with that one focus in terms of the economic side to the SDG, which also encompasses a much more wider view of, of a deprivation. And so we understand that um, as a ministry, as a country, that our response also has to be multidimensional. And so definitely the work of the SIB and that of the ministry then also has to be multidimensional and also has to be multi-sectorial. So specific also to us in terms of the ministry, understanding that we also then in terms of the wider MTDS and have that uh, medium term development strategy uh, and, and having um, that responsibility in terms of poverty reduction as the first, one of the first goals within the MTDS, really and truly we start, we start asking ourselves, what is it that we have to do to do so in terms of responding? Understanding the situation as presented just now is one of the responsibility. The second is what is it that we're committing to um, nationally in terms of poverty reduction? One of the most uh, significant things committed by the government is that of the National Social Protection Strategy and that uh, which includes uh, various elements such as the social protection floor, viewing it from a gender responsive um, uh, view, viewing it from a dis disability responsive, vi mm -hmm. responsive view, also ensuring that we're also catering in terms of the um, disaster element of it as well. So what is it that we're also trying to do in terms of comprehensively uh, ensuring that we're responding to poverty? And so from a ministry's standpoint, um, we also are leading as a part of that, interestingly, um, or should say most conveniently, we're having that discussion this week as a part of the um, Social Protection Summit. And so we, what we're doing is hosting basically a national dialogue, or should say continuing a national dialogue on what then becomes the social protection policy commitments that we're making. And of course, that provides us with the frame. And then of course, what then becomes those strategies uh, that we are going to be looking at. And not necessarily just from the, the, the narrow view of uh, immediately supporting families, but a wider view. Uh, we understand that when we're responding in terms of social protection, we have that uh, productivity side of it. So really looking at the active labor market side, really looking at uh, the side in terms of social insurance. Then specifically, we have that social assistance side and, of course, social services side. So bringing entire system together to comprehensively look at it um, from that view. And so the ministry um, having a critical role um, to ensure that we're promoting equality and inclusion has to be a part of that. So specifically there, we're also linked. And of course, when we look at our programming as a ministry um, in terms of responding to poverty, uh, in terms of the block of social assistance and social services, we start asking ourselves, are we really reaching those uh, who we are supposed to reach? Are we really, um, our programs uh, designed in that way that allows us to reach the most vulnerable? Are our programs allowing us to be able to reach the most rural communities, right? And so 
basically, um, as a ministry, those are the questions we've started asking ourselves and, of course, supported by the data uh, so that, of course, our response is stronger. The design of our programs are stronger. The monitoring and evaluation side of our programs are stronger. So, of course, it removes the burden, really, on the um, beneficiary or the intended beneficiary to access the service. So it's, it's really about how is it that we are removing, specific to our ministry, removing persons out of poverty and of course keeping them out of poverty. And so when we look at the linkages between that of the MTDS and that of the work of the ministry, really uh, that is what it helps us to really do. Um, question what we've been doing and of course putting in the necessary changes in terms of policy change, program change, the tools uh, to address poverty in that way. And of course, continuously building um, on what we're doing and evolving what we do. Yeah, and I think that's really important because with the MPI, I think that's why so many countries, and I'm so glad Belize has been a part, one of those countries that have recently taken the initiative to say we want an MPI because for so long countries have just looked at poverty so one-dimensionally and right. just looked at it based on the dollar value as as Ms. Diana said and now we're actually starting to see well why wasn't poverty being re reduced it's because we weren't looking at the full <coughs> picture we weren't seeing what all really encompassed what poverty was and all those dimensions and all the deprivations that we're talking about so I'm really happy Dylan brought mm -hmm. that up as well and also brought up the social protection summit that's happening yeah. this week mm -hmm. we have to plug that yeah. that's right. <laughs> because it, it's so it's it's a really important time right now in the country that we're seeing this happening because it's the first time that so many stakeholders in government are talking about social protection all at once and how they contribute to that piece of the pie, how they contribute to social protection and poverty reduction on a whole. So I'm really excited that, you know, we're talking about this now because it, it, for so long we've talked about it but not knowing that we were talking about it. <laughs> yeah. Fantastic. Yes, um, I know we would have looked at people living in the rural areas and people would say, oh, you think I'm poor but I'm not really poor based on the lifestyle mm -hmm. and the quality of my life. And so I'm sure quality of life factors in um, but that, I, I mean, I leave that to, to you all <laughs> to determine how, yeah. how how do we factor that all of that in. And, and at some point during tonight's show, I'd like if we could get like a profile. So if, if how do you categorize, what are the things that has to be missing, if you can, for me to be, um, to fit, to, to be fitted into that 35% of um, multidimensionally poor, and what are the other categories? If I'm not multidimensionally poor, then where else would I fit um, in terms of how I'm, we're categorized based on poverty or not, yeah. not yeah. experiencing poverty? I'll, I'll jump in, uh, but I'll also leave uh, Ms. Diana also mm -hmm. to, to answer in terms of the um, dimensions of uh, what was agreed to in terms of mm -hmm. the MPI. But I think mm -hmm. if we step back and we ask ourselves in terms of what kind of human development or what kind of development we want to see within these uh, specific communities and we start asking ourselves are they equal or distributed in terms of the six districts that we have mm -hmm. so when we speak to for example access to education is it similar uh, in terms of the access and quality sorry of education mm -hmm. uh, in Toledo versus in um, Corozal or in Belize City in terms of access to health services is it the same um, access as well as quality of health services. When we speak to, um, for example, social services, is it the same? When we speak to standard of living in terms of uh, the quality of the housing stock, all of these things, are we at, in terms of the overall risk, is it the same? Because of course I can, for example, um, have uh, or be considered rich, if I could use that word, um, in a Toledo, but maybe, for example, the quality of services um, in terms of uh, the hospitals or the facilities mm -hmm. uh, might allow me to have to move all the way to a Belize city or outside of the country to access the kind of quality service that I need. And so when we, when we look at it, we want to ensure that the services across the board right, is equal in terms of being able to access the necessary services um, and it's of the same quality. Um, or even better quality across, no? And so when we start looking at that view, how is it, um, and that really affects our citizens in terms of um, ensuring that there's uh, that service access, um, they're not deprived. And so when we look at MPI in terms of the multi-dimensional uh, poverty index, it's really looking at that. 
um, the, the overall um, deprivations and are we facing deprivations, for example, in education, in health, in um, the um, living standards or standards of living, uh, well-being, etc. And so it allows us to question that or it also, as uh, Ms. Diana said, it allows us to be able to identify these indicators that or these common set of in indicators and dimensions that just allows us to see where we are, right? And so we also then have the view that um, there are areas that we need to work in across the board. And so when we start tearing that apart, if I could use that word, mm -hmm. uh, in terms of male versus female, in terms of rural versus urban, in terms of older persons versus children, or for those specific uh, subgroups as well, you know, we have a lot more work to do. But what's important is that we have the data to inform those kinds of decisions, really, that is important. So uh, the data really helps us to bring the visibility and the light uh, to the situation even further understanding that even children, for example, are affected differently uh, within the household um, than an adult, mm -hmm. right? And so uh, we might not see that or we might not always want to view it that way. But of course, each individual um, has to be viewed within the household. And of course, the household itself has to be viewed differently. You know? So those are the questions that, that really helps us to, to really answer and of course, uh, dissect these things in a different way. Maybe if we can also bring Ms. Anna in to talk about maybe more in detail with the MPI. What did the dimensions look like and what are some of the indicators that Ms. D was asking about? How do we see what poverty looks like in terms of the MPI? Okay, so as I said, we, we look at four broad dimensions that cover different aspects of well-being. Um, we covered education, health living standards which has to do with um, characteristics of the dwelling that people live in and, and a a access to certain assets and so on and employment so under the education dimension we look at um you know children who are of school age whether or not they are attending school um school lag as well if you have school age children who are two years behind or more of the grade that they should be in based on their age um, and we have included, after much discussion by, with our steering committee under education, we included access to internet. We're treating the internet now as an educational tool and saying that um, a household that doesn't have access to internet is at a disadvantage. Uh, for living standards, we look at things like um, what the, the house or the dwelling um, what material the roof and walls and floors are made out of these things have implications for um you know the the quality of housing that people have access to um perhaps even you know their their vulnerability in the case of a natural disaster uh, we look at cooking fuel um type of cooking fuel uh, asset ownership so you know various household assets that um, add to the standard of living and we look at overcrowding, whether or not you have three or more individuals per bedroom in a dwelling. Um, under employment, we look at, of course, unemployment, if persons who are of, um, above the age of 24 are unemployed, but also underemployment, persons are employed, but they are not employed, you know, full time. Um, uh, we also look at informal employment um, because who persons who are underemployed or employed in the informal sector tend to um, bring a lower level of income to the household than those who are employed in the formal sector. Um, and they also, for example, under informal employment are more likely to not be paying social security, so not have access to that particular service. And then under health, um, we looked at things like food security, whether or not persons in the household have had to go without food uh, for a day, um, or whether they don't have, you know, enough food for the household or, or enough of a certain quality of food for the household. Uh, we look also at things like um, the water source, whether they have um, a safe water source for their drinking water and whether they have safe sanitation facilities. All of these things are a part of the health dimension. And um, so, you know, there are 17 of these these indicators, which are basically um, a need or a service that, that are, you know, essential for basic well-being. Um, and for a household to be considered multidimensionally poor, there is no one 
indicator that measures that a person or a household sorry can be deprived in any one of these or any combination of these mm -hmm. but it is not until they have enough accumulated and so for us it's, it's approximately um, a quarter of all the indicators that we have more or less that's the cutoff and so for households who are deprived in about a quarter or more of these indicators those households then are multidimensionally poor um, the remainder of households they are just not multidimensionally poor by this measure it's just they are multidimensionally poor or they're not um, we are looking at perhaps establishing some ranges for households who might be right close to the margin where we we might consider them to be um, vulnerable of falling into multidimensional poverty because they are so close to that threshold. Um, but right now, we only have that distinction of, yes, the household is, is poor, or no, it's not poor. Um, and I, I'm glad you mentioned about the, you know, the, the cultural differences, um, especially among our indigenous population. And that has been a discussion from ever since, since we've been measuring poverty just by money measures it's you know it's it's been a discussion um and we do have to be mindful that there are differences in the way of life and in cultures and so on but you know we also have to be mindful that it does put a household and its members to a disadvantage or at a disadvantage to not have access to these basic services so you know yes the the um the you know the the construction of homes from from wood and touch that that is a traditional way of living and we do have to be mindful of that but at the same time it is it is true that a, a dwelling that is made of of wood and touch is less sturdy and would be more vulnerable in the case of a natural disaster than one that is made of concrete and so um you know it it is just an objective truth that not having access to many of these um, basic services and needs just puts a household and its members at a disadvantage relative to the rest of the population. Okay. Thank you for that um, clarification and information, Ms. Diana. Uh, we'll take a quick break and we'll come right back with our conversation. Stay tuned to the Galen Hour. on fire these guys have some top speed of over 29 miles an hour they blaze Oscar Oscar Kuros have attack Oscar Oscar Kuros the 2023 cross country champion look at the feel of that hi everyone my name is Oscar Kuros I graduate of Yellen University with a bachelor's degree in environmental science I'm currently pursuing my professional career in cycling with the Miami Blazers. I can safely say that the critical skills as well as the time management skills that I've obtained from Yellen University has helped me in many ways that I could have imagined. And I can honestly say that I've applied these skills to both my cycling career and my everyday life as a professional. I want to serve as a great influence to the youth of today as to why an an education is important. Let's get back into the classroom. Let's prove them wrong. Opportunities are limitless. Become a member of the Gillen Eagle Alumni Association. We connect with your fellow classmates. We discover the Gillen Eagle spirit and reawaken your inner eagle. Come home, come celebrate. 20 years of excellence with Gillen University. For more information, contact 636-8881. Good night again and welcome back to the Gillen Hour. We just heard from Ms. Diana um, Castillo Trejo about what are the 17 indicators that help us to determine whether or not we are multidimensionally poor 
or not. And those are the two categories. You either are or you're not. And that's mm -hmm. quite good to know, right? But of course, she also mentioned that they're looking at ways to create additional categories and probably to look at those who are just at the margin of becoming multidimensionally poor. Uh, but these are interesting um, facts and information and indicators for us as a nation and people to understand. Um, how are we measured um, when it comes to poverty? What are the factors that are looked at? What are the indicators? What are the things within our own communities that we should be mindful of? And I really liked what you had said earlier, um, um, Dylan, about the access and quality. While we may think that we, what we're getting in our district is good when we have to leave our district for better, to come to Belize City or a uh, um, Cayo district, um, then do, do are we really getting the best of what is available, what we should have access to um, in our particular districts? And so from one district to another, um, it differs. Yeah. yeah. Right? Okay, so um, I think it comes to a point now where it will be good to hear some of the initiatives that um, the Ministry of Human Development, Families and Indigenous Peoples Affairs um, are engaging, is engaging in to address um, the poverty issue. I think, thanks thank, for that. Um, so specific to the MTDS, um, 17 might be the lucky number uh, because mm -hmm. we, ha we have 17 um, related um, actions in terms of the um, MTDS itself. And so across that, the ministry um, and of course its associated um, agencies. And so when we look at the ministry, uh, we are speaking to that of the Department of Human Services. We're speaking to that of the Community Rehabilitation Department. We have the Women and Family Support Department. And of course, we also have our, uh, the, our associated, if I could call it, ag um, agencies in terms of the National Commission for Families and Children, the National Women's Commission, the National Council on Aging, and then of course, the Indigenous Peoples Commission. And so when we look at all of that work, Really, it's, it's trying to now see, as a ministry one, based on our portfolio, what is our overall response. And so when we look at, for example, the Department of Human Services, that's really our child protection uh, response. And of course, that comes with uh, that of the parenting side, which is a preventative side, but there's also the protection side. Uh, and specific to the protection side, we have the child protection services and the child protection uh, specialized services which really supports in terms of um, uh, placement, anti-trafficking um, as well. Um, and then we also have the community rehabilitation department that really looks at juvenile justice system, right? Um, supporting young people who come in conflict with the law and then if I could take the women and family support department really looks at the gender, the economic empowerment and the um, family support side. And so when I speak to that of the um, social assistance and social services side of the poverty, uh, the national, um, the social protection strategy parts of it, really we're, or the system, we're really looking at some of those elements in terms of uh, the social assistance which speaks to the women and family support department and what programs we support. So currently we have been running as a ministry in its different um, nomenclature, the boost program, for example. That's one consistent program as a conditional mm -hmm. cash transfer or a co-responsibility cash transfer program. Basically, um, that program really helps in terms of providing a steady cash transfer to families uh, in an effort to be able to support um, outcomes. So one being zero to four, in terms of uh, children zero to four, we have, for example, pre pregnant mothers. So pregnant mothers ensuring a healthy um, a healthy start in terms of uh, the birth, right? We also have for um, uh, children in schools, pr in terms of primary schools and secondary school, that's really ensuring that you have um, realizing those education outcomes. We also support through that program, um, older persons 60 plus, and of course that's uh, in an effort to support um, older persons uh, who don't, for example, have any kind of pension. Uh, and so that's, that's a support there. And lastly, persons with disabilities. And so that program is designed as a way of providing that kind of uh, con steady cash transfer. One of the things we've also piloted as a ministry is that of Boost Plus. And so we recognize, as uh, Ms. Trejo mentioned, that as we're looking also at uh, the support that's needed outside of just the income elements, 
is that we really need to wrap around also services. Uh, and so in terms of supporting the family um, with the productive side, right? And so we're really looking at what are those skills uh, that we can, of course, incorporate within the household that allows, for example, um, for persons to be job ready, right? And so um, it also helps us to be able to utilize the monitoring and evaluation side, right? So when we look at it um, from a point of uh, these 60 different indicators across health uh, education, we really help to measure um, from a wider view um, where families are and of course how we can also help them in terms of supporting some uh, the, the families in the family in general, no? Uh, so we have the Boost, the Boost Plus program, and then in general, the ministry provides um, public assistance to families. And so when we look at those public assistance support, we're talking about, for example, education support, uh, medical support, um, funeral grants. Um, uh, if I, um, we also have uh, housing, rental, so numerous. Um, numerous different kinds of support that's that's also provided but again that's also one of one of the conversations we've really been having uh this week is to understand that um, anything we do in terms of social assistance is that there's an element of periodicity that we also have to consider right um and so when we speak to three things the overall coverage as we mentioned right what is the support we're providing? What's the coverage of this support? So is it that these support are only centralized within one district and not necessarily national? The adequacy of support, ensuring that as we're looking at, for example, um, whatever transfer we're making to families, is it adequate? Is it helping them to move from the point they are in terms of uh, being able to uh, support uh, the families both to reach, reach um, both to, re both to realize that of the outcome you're trying to, but otherwise. In many countries, as the literature says, there's um, the, any family that also receive these kinds of conditional cash transfer have utilized it in different ways to evolve in terms of the family. And then, of course, in terms of um, the adequacy, we want to ensure that we are also um, looking at these this support to ensure that they are not the same over a longer period of time. So for example, if we're giving, for example, $44, as I mentioned to the inner session, in 2010, is that it's not the same $44 in 2023, mm -hmm. right? And so from at least that view, uh, we can understand exactly um, that we, we also have to review it, no? And so that, that in terms of the Boost, the Boost Plus program, the, the public assistance, and of course our general programs, as I said, offered uh, by these uh, different departments really helps us to be able to provide the support family need, but also that when it comes to understanding the wider social protection system and participating in it, really and truly as a, as a ministry that supports vulnerable families, we also have to be the lead. And so as a part of the what is called the SDG joint program, the ministry is also trying to uh, play a critical lead in terms of being able to engage with our partners, engage with partners at, in terms of government, civil society, uh, unions, churches, academia, media, young people and family themselves to be able to really understand what are our challenges, uh, what are our limitations and of course what is it that we can do to really address poverty. As um, Ms. Treho mentioned just now, really if we can go in to these communities and really understand what are their contexts, it really helps us to be able to respond better, right? It also helps us to shift the way we do business currently. And so that's part of the process. Um, poverty, as we have always known it, um, has been measured, one, by an income um, element. We've shifted that to now ensuring that it's multidimensional. We don't know as we continue to learn about poverty and understand the various contexts, what it is that we'll have to do in terms of fully um, measure poverty and so we have the opportunity through the multidimensional poverty index to use different dimensions and to use different indicators but the reality is that those are proxy still uh, for us to be able to at least get an understanding in terms of what we're trying to do and the importance is that the conversations around poverty are happening and that we're doing so together 
and of course making decisions in terms of um, at least accepting for a period of time what we're utilizing to measure poverty and of course understanding poverty and the global trends are changing and so as a country we also have to participate in that. You mentioned, I, thank you Dylan for sharing those programs and initiatives from human development. You mentioned a really good point about how human development contributes to the social assistance and social services part of social protection and poverty reduction on a whole, which is a very important part. Correct. But there's also cross-cutting themes when it comes to poverty reduction and social protection that Correct. are still as equally as important as well, such as data generation. And so I wanted to ask um, Ms. Trejo what kind of programs and initiatives maybe that SIB has that is increasing those capacities with data generation or data analysis or creating the data that we need to support these programs and initiatives that human development is doing? Well, we one of the, the responsibilities of the SIB um, is that we act as coordinator of what we call the National Statistical System, which is just the network of all the agencies that produce statistics along with the SIB. And so in terms of ensuring that we're producing data, but not just producing data, but producing data that our partners, such as the Ministry of Human Development, need. We work along with these agencies um, to support them, uh, to increase their capacity to be able to produce. So health indicators, for example, are produced by the Ministry of Health. Um, the SIB can't produce everything on our own. Um, and so, you know, different line ministries have responsibility for different statistics and we lend support to them um, whether it's in the form of you know sourcing technical assistance if they need some assistance um, to to build capacity in how to produce their indicators um, providing providing you know basic training and statistical methods um, we lend support to them we also um, have an annual data collection exercise in partnership with the sustainable development unit where we go to the line ministries um, and different data producers and collect all these indicators and data from them. So any, um, for example, the SDGs, any SDG for which there is data out there here in Belize, we as a part of our annual data collection program, go out there to the other agencies and collect the data from them and we do the work of vetting it, compiling it and publishing it in one central location. Um, we have on our website an indicators portal called the Belize National Statistical System Indicators Portal. And that is our central platform, our hub, where we place all the available indicators um, for the country, our SDGs. Um, when we have our indicators for the MTDS, those will be placed there as well. And so at one convenient uh, or in one convenient location, our partners such as the ministry or such as the MED can readily access whatever data they need. Um, and, and not just that, you know, we work with the, the data users themselves to determine what additional data um, is needed to meet their needs. That's where the MPI actually came from. Um, it evolved out of a need to close that gap in poverty statistics. We know we need to measure it. We measure it too infrequently, and so um, the collaboration that produced the MPI, the, the MPI program here at the SIB, was um, a part of an effort to meet that need. So we work also to, to try and close gaps where there are unmet data needs from our partners. Great. Yeah, so um, <coughs> you mentioned, Dylan, that you do what you do in collaboration or in partnership with civil society and other stakeholders. And you kind of hit um, on one of the questions I was going to ask is oftentimes, as a nation, we depend on our government. I mean, and I asked this question last week as well, or I brought it up, um, but maybe we can um, reemphasize or create more awareness of how important it is for all stakeholders to contribute to improving poverty within our nation. Um, I don't know if you want to say something on that, but I, I, I really think it's important to not, for our people to not think that everything must be addressed only by a government that operates with limited resources. Mm. Definitely. Um, and mm -hmm. I think as, as we've been discussing uh, from the start of the show, one, it's a multidimensional issue. Mm -hmm. It's not an individual 
entity responds, whether that entity is government or otherwise. It has to, it's a multidimensional issue, it's a complex issue, and it has to be done with a multidimensional response. And so when we speak to multidimensional response, it definitely comes beyond that of just a Ministry of Human Development, and it definitely be, comes beyond that of the government. And so any solution or any um, policy programs, tools we develop in response to poverty has to come with a multidimensional approach. And so when we speak to the inclusion of government, civil society, academia in terms of the research, uh, in terms of the um, intergenerational transfer of this knowledge of understanding poverty is important, definitely. So um, the universities, junior colleges, etc. Um, it has to really start from early, really, in terms of academia. Uh, when we speak to, for example, the different um, groups, uh, the churches, the unions, the, um, the media, and the role they play in terms of also lobbying and advocating, because really and truly, um, the, the role in terms of both, the, as, we, as we see in terms of policy, the internal and external forces, all of that has to play a role in terms of changes that we want, right? And so um, understanding that the reality is that it's multidimensional um, allows us to be able to ensure that we reach, because as I also mentioned um, in, in our sessions, that's the only way we really would be able to reach those who needs to be reached. Uh, and of course, it also allows us to switch from this center-based approach as we normally have where uh, services are institu in institutions and really shift to actually take people to serv um, the services to people. And why do we do that? Um, one, in everything we do as it relates to the poverty response, there has to be that public trust, right? Public trust comes from the use of data right public trust comes from ensuring that there's confidentiality in everything that we do especially um, the fact that we are um, utilizing persons information and so um, one of the most critical part of working also for example uh, with the SIB is understanding that there has to be data sharing protocols for example um, information can't just be circulated um, how we want right and so it's important because we're trying to build that public trust and that comes with ensuring that confidentiality is at the basis of that right and so it, it's really important that anything we do comes with that multi-dimensional way of working together or it becomes a lot more challenging because we have duplication of work we have replication of work and of course we release already limited resources mm -hmm. Uh, that we have. And so part of the conversation um, that we've also been having is financing uh, for uh, social protection, for example, and addressing poverty. And part of that really is how is it that we're doing our business currently? Is it that we're, um, is it in terms of areas where we can, of course, uh, reorganize how we uh, really uh, share the existing pie? Right? And so what is it that another ministry is doing that, you know, maybe, for example, we can work together to be able to spread that uh, funds in a much more further way, you know, in terms of the overall coverage. And so that's the kind of conversation which really is based on a multidimensional, multi-stakeholder um, approach. You know? And so we say we need a whole of government approach, but more so we need a whole of society approach in terms of the response. Thank you for that response. Yeah. Um, um, we are, we have like six minutes to end of our show, and I would really want to see if, um, Ms. Trejo, would you be able to give us like a poverty profile for a country? If somebody is researching Belize or, you know, and want to see how do I describe the state of the nation when it comes to poverty? What are the indicators and the percentages as we sit here tonight? What are those indicators saying for Belize? Okay, um, so as I said, if, if, we, if we want to, you know, come up with a general profile of, of who in our country is most likely to be poor based on these indicators that we have measured for the MPI, um, I would say, you know, it is still um, our rural households, our rural population, um, our larger households, 
because obviously there are more persons in there whose needs need to be met, um, especially households that have children. These are the ones that are more likely to be poor and even more so households that are located in the south, south of the country, especially the Toledo district. So, you know, maybe the, 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 the profile of uh, um, uh, the most vulnerable type of household then might be a household in rural Toledo um, that has a lot of children in it um, and where the head of the household is either not working or not working full time. Um, that's the kind of picture that we can get from the MPI. Um, however, you know, as we move from one part of the country to another, um, the types of deprivations that are more common will vary. Um, and, and again, this is part of the beauty of the MPI is that it allows us to break out um, how poverty is manifested and how people are experiencing poverty in different parts of the country across different groups um, and identify what needs to be targeted very specifically to, to different regions or groups within our population. Um, as I said, about 35% of our population is multidimensionally poor by that measure. Um, going back to 2018 data, which is the last monetary poverty study that we did, um, about half of all our population are money poor, which obviously, you know, is just measuring one one way um, or one criteria for for you know, determining poverty, but the, the MPI looks much broader at, at some more direct um, measures of well-being. But that is more or less, you know, what what the, the picture of poverty is right now. We will see as we continue to produce the MPI, um, how that might change. The labor market situation certainly has changed since 2021. Yeah. Um, hopefully, uh, things like the education indicators might have improved as we, you know, we come more and more out of the, the pandemic and the ill effects that that has had on children and school attendance. And so we will see over time how, how things evolve within the country. But that is where we are right now. Yeah. And I think even though that's the poverty profile as of right now, I think with the projects and programs that are in the MTDS currently and what will be added as we go along, because like we said last week, it's a living document. As we start to add to that and start to implement them, I think we're going to see that picture and that profile change a lot, especially with the implementation of the social protection strategy. And now we have all our social protection partners working together. I think that's going to shift soon. Great. I mean, the work never ends. When you never. look at the areas of well or well-being that you all focus on, this is just a forever long yeah. for yeah. the rest of Definitely. our nation's <laughs> um, existence is a job that we'll have to do yeah. right and so um but i want to give you an opportunity amdelan to give your some last words um before we wind down the show definitely um i think one of my my parting statements would be one as we look at as we look at poverty and of course we look at the wider development work that we're doing here in Belize is really to shift that. Um, when we look at even, for example, the Constitution, right, the protection of rights is not given by the Constitution, right? Really, it's just a protection of the rights within the Constitution. And so we have a right in terms of not being excluded. Um, and so that's really what poverty does to us in terms of it's an exclusion. Right, and so as a responsible government, as a government really, um, as articulated within the MTDS, for example, these policies and programs really helps us to do so in terms of ensuring that we are protecting the rights of all Belizeans. And so from the frame of, for example, the social protection work that we're trying to do, it's really to see that as well, right? We are trying to ensure the rights of all Belizeans and the protection of all Belizeans. So uh, looking at the full spectrum of the, the response and I think it's important to see that because it also shifts our view in terms of ensuring that we're not doing this just because we want to focus on the most vulnerable but we understand that across the life cycle we are at risk and at any point in time uh, we become or we may become uh, vulnerable to some situation and so what is the protection that exists for us 
all across the life cycle, all across the life cycle. And really, it is our responsibility also as a government to ensure those things are in place from birth all the way through to older persons. And so that is really significant. And what is important is that the way we do that is that we have to respond in terms of package of policies, a uh, package of programs, and of course, tools that allows us to shift the way we do business. And of course, that is really the kind of change and shift in conversation that we are also trying to promote because the reality is that we know right the, the challenges we know the limitations and we know that the kind of government that is necessary is what the mtds really promotes and that's a multi-dimensional way of working it's a multi-dimensional approach Definitely. and we expect a multi-dimensional response that's right <laughs> miss diana would you like to give us some last words um, before we Wrap yes, up the night. Um, I just, you know, want to highlight, I, I, I've been <laughs> talking for the entire show just about numbers pretty much, mm -hmm. but, you know, I want to emphasize that th these numbers are important. This information is important. Um, I, I yeah, am very pleased to see that um, with, the, with the MTDS, um, with the, the development of new programs and policies, that there's a shift towards more evidence-based decision-making. And the data that we produce is actually being used in practical ways to help guide um, the development of these programs and policies. And we start out from a place where we are much more likely to be successful, to positively impact the lives of our people when we base these decisions and these plans on actual information and evidence. Um, I'm very happy for the partnership mm -hmm. with the MHD. Um, Dylan and I see far too much of each other. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, we, we partner in quite a number of activities, um, especially in the area of measuring poverty. Um, and as, as we move forward, measuring social protection effectiveness. Um, and, you know, the SIB is just grateful to be here to, to support in that way. And we are fully committed to continuing um, playing our part in this process. Thank you for all that you do. Whenever we're looking for any information on our country, that's our first yeah. um, resource that we yeah. go to, what yeah. SIB has out, and then we can move on from there. But we need to first see what's been. So thank you, um, Ms. Trejo, for all that you do, you and your team. We know it's a huge feat, but, and you achieve it for us yeah. um, yearly and monthly. <laughs> thank you. Gabrielle. Just going to keep it short and sweet. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you to our guests, of course, to Dylan and Ms. Diana. Um, I, I know how much we work mm -hmm. hard towards, especially, you know, implementing the MTDS and all the strategic objectives, but especially poverty reduction. It's strategic objective number one for a reason. And so I want to thank the guests for being here and talking about their part in that. And just thank you again, Galen University, for highlighting these, these programs and initiatives. Oh, it is our pleasure. And so on behalf of Galen University, I thank all of you for being here tonight. Um, for the benefit of those who weren't, who didn't tune in for the first show, um, Gabrielle is an economist in the Ministry of Economic Development. Galen University is collaborating with the Ministry of Economic Development for this season of the Galen Hour. And so we heard from the Ministry of Human Development. We heard from Statistical Institute of Belize tonight. But in the other shows, we'll be hearing from the other ministries. So yeah. our technocrats will be in studio or coming in live yeah. on Zoom. Gabrielle will either be in studio or virtually, but she but will be, be here. <laughs> she be, be with us every Wednesday night. And let us tune in and talk about our nation and the medium-term development strategies um, that are being, that our, our government is looking at um, achieving for the benefit and the well-being of our nation and our people. It's always a pleasure to be here with you on Wednesday nights. Thank you for joining us tonight. The Gillen Hour is a production of Gale University. It focuses on academic excellence, sustainable development, and lifelong learning. It is a service we do for our, to inform our nation and our people, and we are happy that you join us. And um, let this season, if no other, be one that you join us to find out about um, our nation yeah. and Belize and how we're doing. Thank you, and good night. See you same place, same time next week, Wednesday.